Hello, I'm Robin Bigwood, and I'm a harpsichordist and a player of all sorts of keyboard instruments, um, early and modern. And I'm here in the Horniman Museum in Dulwich in southeast London, and I've been uh, recording some music and uh, filming it on this wonderful virginals here, uh, Italian from Naples. It was built in 1668, uh, and it's by Guaracino. These two pieces are by Gregorio Strozzi, who was a Neapolitan composer. Uh, his single book of music comes from 1687. Uh, and in fact, the style and the way the music is written suggests that it was probably much, much older. And he himself was in his compositional approach, looking back to an older way of working. So in fact, rather than the music being written out very neatly as it is here in uh, this modern copy, uh, it would have been written out laboriously in all the, the separate parts. Actually very difficult for a uh, harpsichordist or organist to play. But it's a lovely piece. Uh, the first is a sonata, uh, the name simply means sounded, as in a piece which is to be sounded with an instrument of some kind, in this case, the virginals. Uh, and it's got those typical features of contrasted sections. So we start with something quite perky and lively, and before you know it, there's something which is much more relaxed and languid, and then we end with a fast section again. And then the second piece is a corrente, a much simpler piece. Uh, it's, it's a dance movement. And I don't think it's something that people would actually dance to. Uh, it's quite a loud instrument, but as soon as you had a few people stomping about on the floor, I think that it would be uh, overwhelmed. Uh, but it's the kind of dance that the individual harpsichordist could enjoy and perhaps with a few friends listening. Thank you. 
This is a Toccata by Frescobaldi, who I think was one of the best, one of the most exciting composers in Italy in the 17th century. And he wrote principally for keyboard instruments, for harpsichord, organ, virginals. He did write for other instruments as well, but I think you can tell that his first love was, was always the, the keyboard. And in a Toccata like this one, it's a very special kind of piece. So the name means to touch. Uh, so touching perhaps in the sense of exploring the instrument and exploring what is possible. And in these Toccatas, it's as if we go on a journey. Uh, there are many different kinds of writing, many different uh, states of mind and different colours. I almost get the feeling that what we have with these is a written down version of what Frescobaldi would have played had he just sat himself at the instrument and gone on a kind of flight of, of fancy. And there are sections which are rhythmic and driving and use lots of repetition but then we will morph into a section which is much more spacious and uh, sort of fanciful and fantastical. And uh, somehow he brings together these different elements into a really rewarding whole.
This is a piece by Frescobaldi. It's called Aria Detta la Frescobalda. And we think that, uh, well, the title literally means a song called the Frescobalda. And uh, we think that it might be something that was written for or um, uh, with somebody in, in mind, perhaps a daughter, perhaps his wife, uh, but certainly a female member of the Frescobaldi family. And uh, there is a kind of female association with these smaller keyboard instruments in general in the Baroque period. Uh, very famous are the paintings by the Dutch artist Vermeer uh, that show similar kinds of, of instruments, but built in a different place, and nearly always women uh, playing them. And, uh, and it's a really interesting um, association. I don't think it was by, by any means exclusive. I'm sure that men played these instruments as well, and women also played larger uh, keyboard instruments. But certainly there's a, a really interesting historical uh, background to that. This uh, piece is essentially a theme and variations. So we get a very beautiful melody to begin with. It's got a kind of haunting quality uh, in the same way as the English tune Green Sleeves uh, does. Um, I, I find it very evocative. And then in four more sections, Frescobaldi explores the possibilities of that tune. And actually, we don't ever really hear the tune again, but what we do hear is the chordal structure, the accompaniment, which has got all sorts of different material built over the top of it. And again, Frescobaldi loved his contrast. So we get a section which is really sturdy in character, and then one which is dancing, and then one again, which is expressive and tender in nature, and then uh, finally a dance to finish.
This is the Chacona uh, by Storace. He's a composer we don't know very much about, only that he put out a book of keyboard music in the 1660s, very close in time period to when this uh, individual instrument was, uh, was made. And Storace loved to write pieces that had a repetitive nature. So he would take small patterns, sometimes bass lines, sometimes chord sequences. They might only be two or four or eight bars long. And then they come around dozens, if not hundreds of times. This one is based around this pattern. And this also comes dozens, if not hundreds of times. It allows the composer to explore all the possibilities. So quite often he will give really impressive, sparkly material to, to my right hand. But then later that interest will pass to the left hand and it's as if the solo duty goes over to, uh, to the bass. And it makes me think of some modern practice like jazz and rock music, uh, where this kind of way of working of somebody laying down a pattern or a groove and then just repeating it whilst others take turns to make a contribution, it's really common. Um, Jazz musicians do it all the time with the 12 bar blues and uh, there's really no difference in their practice and what is going on here. This is a substantial piece, um, as I mentioned, many, many repetitions. And one feature that I love is that Storace does not stay in the same key to begin with. So this is uh, written in C major and many other pieces of this kind would stay in C major from beginning to end. But it's almost as if in this one, when he starts to sense that perhaps there are not so many opportunities left to explore C major, simply modulates, he moves into a different key, into F and then into B flat major. That's quite unusual for, 16, uh, for the 1660s. And, uh, and it adds a really lovely element to this piece.
I'm going to play two pieces by Giovanni Salvatore, and these were published in 1641. So about 25 years before this instrument was made. And uh, Salvatore, in this first piece, uh, the canzone, um, does some really lovely things, which are unusual, I would say. Um, I have not really encountered them in, in any other uh, works by other composers. The first thing he does is give a, gives me writing which recalls the sound of perhaps a choir or a small group of singers uh, singing together. So rather than lots of lines overlapping and intertwining, everybody's moving together, a kind of syllabic, uh, homophonic, we would call it, uh, way of um, presenting the musical material. But he contrasts it with other kinds of writing. There's something else remarkable in, in this piece. One of the themes that we hear coming back repeatedly starts off like life like this. We hear this perhaps a couple of dozen times. And it's quite usual for a composer to explore the contrapuntal possibilities of combining themes with other themes and, and with copies of itself. But then something very unusual happens here. In the closing stages, the theme becomes an accompanying figure, but at half the speed and in a very beautiful version of itself. And we might term that thematic transformation. It means it's the same theme, but it's changed into a different form. And I can't really think of, of uh, another example of that in early keyboard music, or certainly uh, keyboard music from this time and place. And then after that beautiful piece, a much lighter, fun dance piece, uh, Corrente.
This is a piece by Pasquini, a composer who was based in Rome. Uh, it's called the Toccata con lo scherzo del cuco. And uh, like the name suggests, it's a toccata, uh, a piece for keyboard instrument that really does explore the sound of a cuckoo's call. Now, sadly, the cuckoo is a bird that we, we hear only very rarely in the UK uh, these days. I can remember it when I was younger being much more common, but I don't think I've heard a real cuckoo for some years. But it has that really distinctive call. Uh, two notes, a minor third apart. And often you hear it in the distant woodland echoing around. It's a, it's a lovely sound. And it's a sound associated with spring and early summer when the birds are actually in, in this country. And um, this piece is perhaps not to be taken too seriously. Uh, it's almost a challenge perhaps to the composer to try and work in as many cuckoos into the into the musical flow as he possibly could. And uh, we were talking here, we wondered if there are literally hundreds of them, and if, if you could even count them. Uh, certainly at one point later in the piece, there seem to be so many cuckoos overlapping that there must be a whole flock of them, which I, I don't think happens very often in nature. Uh, but um, somehow just with these two notes, Pasquini manages to make a very satisfying work. I think it is lighthearted, it's a bit of a joke, uh, but it's also charming.
I think that as, for as long as I can remember, um, back to when I was really young, I liked unusual and exotic instruments and I liked the possibilities offered by strange and unusual sounds. And probably that meant that I had an interest in parallel in electronic instruments and old keyboard instruments and uh, organs, harpsichords, old pianos. I love the modern piano too, but I think it's the variety and the almost unexpected aspect of encountering these kinds of, of instruments that, that I really loved. It took me until I was a student at the Royal College of Music uh, to properly study them. And up until that point, I think I'd only had fleeting experience with proper harpsichords, good sounding old, old harpsichords and um, similar kinds of instruments. Uh, but when I finally experienced firsthand what was possible in that area, then I felt there was no turning back. And, uh, and I was very happy then to commit to studying this kind of instrument um, full time. Yes, there is quite a bit of keyboard music uh, from the time that this instrument was built. Um, in Italy, uh, there were major centers uh, of composition. So Venice, uh, Rome, particularly uh, Naples, a few other places. And uh, of course, it was difficult to travel in those days, even to pass between Naples and Rome was probably two days in a terribly uncomfortable horse-drawn carriage over uh, mountainous uh, landscapes. But the music traveled. And in fact, there'd, there'd been keyboard music since the end of the 1500s, certainly, even, some even earlier than that. But in the 1600s, I think there was a good trade, uh, even with the music of Venice, for example, in the north of Italy, um, being distributed to many other cities in Europe and even to London and, and into the UK. These days, we have it so lucky, of course, because much of the hard work has been done by editors and by collectors and by real experts in this area who've given us lovely, clean, modern copies of, of this music. And I certainly have at home uh, a wall of, um, uh, of, of bookcases um, containing my, uh, my music. Uh, presumably it would have been a lot more expensive in the 17th century, uh, but it was a similar idea. At that, at that stage, music was being published and traded and transported and you could buy it. Playing old instruments is certainly very exciting uh, for players like me um, because we learn so much from them. Uh, we learn the way our touch should be, the way our hand position should be in order to get the best sound and, and to play with as much accuracy um, as possible. Of course, we don't usually, most of us, I should say, um, uh, do not have the really old instruments in our ownership, in our own, uh, in our own homes, simply because they're so rare and so valuable. So we play modern copies. Um, <clears throat> a maker would have taken measurements of an instrument like this one and figured out how it was constructed, what woods were used, what makes it sound as it does, and then actually can construct a reproduction uh, instrument. And 
that's what most players have, most modern players. I think I own four now um, that are modern copies of old instruments. And in the case of this virginals, it's in such good playing position, uh, playing uh, condition, I should say, that it feels just like, like a new one, I have to say. It's as if it, it rolled off the production line yesterday. It completely reliable. Um, I, I, I can find absolutely no fault with it at all. So in that respect, there's maybe no difference um, between playing a new and an old instrument. But it is different when these old ones have had a more uh, colourful life, should we say, and they come to us in less good condition. I've certainly played old instruments where the keys are not at all level. Um, so it almost looks like a kind of a mini mountain range as you, as you look along the keys. That makes it much, much harder to play evenly for one thing. Um, it also comes down to how the instrument has been set up internally and whether the resistance of the pluck of each of the keys uh, is equal. Because that, again, if it's, if it's done well, as this one is, it, it makes it a delight to play. Uh, if not, if some are very strong, if others are very light, uh, that, that can make it extremely uh, difficult to, uh, to make a good fist of, of, of a piece uh, when, when playing on the old ones. With all these instruments, uh, we have to tune them quite often. Uh, it's not like a modern piano that you could probably get away with at home at least, tuning only once or twice a year. It's not unusual uh, on a day of a concert to be tuning an instrument like this four or five times per day. Uh, uh, they stay in tune pretty well, but there's always something that we can fix even after a few hours. And learning to tune is something that goes hand in hand with learning to play these, these instruments. There are many different ways that we can tune them, and those ways have varied in history as well. So how a modern piano is tuned is not very similar at all to the way that an instrument like this might have been tuned in Italy in the 1660s. And uh, this would typically have used a tuning system called mean tone. And what that means is that some chords and some intervals sound better than others. And they've been made to sound better at the expense of a few which sound terrible. Uh, so if I play a few chords, it's good, it's good, all good, but here, still good, not good. And these chords are the sort of flip side of the good sounding uh, ones. So at this time on this kind of instrument, it wasn't necessarily possible to play in all 12 keys uh, of music on a, on a 12 note keyboard like this. And we also hear uh, these tuning discrepancies in, in another way as well. Um, so what I played you there was uh, major chords, but if we compare some of these intervals, it's good, it's good, not good at all. Again, this is the price we pay for having eight really good keys. We have four bad ones. And when we end up with an interval like this, which is really so bad that it can't be used, it's referred to as the wolf interval. Uh, and um, I think it's quite an apt term. Uh, 
These kinds of tuning, uh, mean tone tunings, are what the composers of that era would have been brought up with. So for them, it would have seemed quite, uh, quite normal, quite usual. Uh, but it doesn't mean to say that they didn't enjoy the possibilities that were offered by the, by the tunings. So the fact that there were some chords that sounded really good and others that sounded really bad, and even individual intervals that were much less good than similar intervals around them, the composers absolutely knew how to exploit those differences. And so we will hear in pieces that are perhaps expressing a really heartfelt emotion or something full of anguish or pain, the composer will switch to using these harsh or painful sounding uh, intervals. Uh, so yes, they enjoyed the fact that many keys and many chords sounded beautiful and were stable, but they also knew how to, how to use the tunings for musical and emotional effect. Ornamentation is a big part of the early keyboard style in general, I would say. It's these little twiddles, we could term them for, for uh, want of a better name, um, that give such life and colour uh, to, and, and actually rhythmic drive often to, to the music. But as to what we should play and when, and whether the composer specifically asks for it or not, that's a much, much bigger question and much harder to answer. As it happens, in this Italian 17th century music, there's not so much ornamentation written into, into the music itself. So there are a few marks. We might see a letter T or TR, meaning a trill or trillo. And, uh, and this might mean a, a quick repetition of, um, of a couple of notes or alternation of, of, of a couple of notes. Uh, but compared to some later music and from other places like the French 18th century style, which is absolutely smothered in written ornaments, which the composers tell us we must only do those and not any others, um, this is comparatively clean. This is... Uh, start of, of one of the uh, correntes uh, that I played. And in this passage, there's just two marked ornaments. Um, if I play it with no ornaments at all, it sounds like this. And then with the marked ornaments, So there were just those two places where we get the, the little uh, alternation and, and repetition of, of notes. And a player would probably add more according to their taste. And I think it's also very dependent on the kind of instrument that you're playing. So this one is very receptive and uh, very supportive of playing or ornaments because it works well. Uh, but there are other instruments, much more challenging, much harder to play, where, where perhaps we, we might even clear out some of the written or ornamentation. Uh, when I played it, I think I added something like this. So a few little bits here and there, a, a turn, um, something a bit more worked here, almost adding to the composition. Um, there's nothing to say that I couldn't put m many more uh, of these ornaments and these twiddles in. Gets a bit sort of laden down with them in the end. Um, 
but some players would do that. It's really open-ended. It's one of the nice things about this style that it can um, take so many different approaches.